All right, so we read yesterday Pasha's Toldos, and we hear the story of Yitzchak dwelling in Gerar in the kingdom of Avimelech. And once Avimelech commands, everybody should uh, treat these people with dignity. Yitzchak planted in that land, and he produced or he found in that land, a hundred sha'arim. We'll see soon what that means. Hashem and Hashem blessed him. The man grew, he became uh, very prosperous. He had many sheep and many cat, much cattle, and uh, many enterprises. The Plishim would jeal- envied him, they were jealous of him. And so um, ensues this whole up and back, this whole um, uh, quarrel about the wells. He digs the wells, they stop them up, uh, yeah, as we're all familiar, and in the end um, he finds Kiyatar, Hircha Vesham Lono Farina Barat. Okay. Um, the Postal alludes to the fact that this was a difficult year. It says he, in that land and in that year. So, in other words, both. Uh, so it was a difficult land and a difficult geographical, di- difficult field. In other words, both the culture, the, the climate, the weather that year, and the specific field where Yitzchak planted were not cut out, alpiteva, according to the laws of nature, to have um, a lot of success. And nevertheless, Yitzchak did find success. He found a hundred shiarim, and Hashem blessed him. Now, Chazal say Bashana Ahi, the, the Torah emphasizes that it was in that year, so that teaches us that it was a time of famine, and that sort of underscores the greatness of this miracle, that even though it was time of famine, Yitzchak, Yitzchak was successful. I saw an interesting thing, which I'm not quite sure what to make of it, um, and that is in the Bavrom and Rambam, he quotes from the Rasag, which seems to be a Rasag in Pasha's Bracious, from Sadi Goin, and he says, you know how you know it was a bad year? Because Yitzchak was successful, be- because, oh, sorry, because all the people, all the Pelishtim were, were, were arguing, were quarreling with him about the, the, the water and the fields and everything, like, why were they quarreling with him? Because he was the only person who was successful. Everybody else's fields didn't produce and everybody else's waters, wells were dried up. So that's what he says. I'm not quite sure what to make of it. First of all, because, I mean, why is he inventing something new when Chazal already say, Bashano Ahi, that year, by the Torah emphasizing that year, it's coming to indicate to us that the year was not so good. But secondly, if you just read the parasha, it seems that the reason they were jealous of him is because of his success. Because he was successful, they kind of used to push him, therefore they were jealous of him. So the fact that they were jealous of him doesn't necessarily mean that it was a bad year, that it was a year of a drought or famine. His success caused their jealousy. Anyway, whatever the case is, however we know it, the bottom line is this was a, a, a tough year, and nevertheless... Um, and nevertheless, he was successful. And not only was the year tough, but the air region when it, wh- where he was investing was also not really a worthwhile investment. It was a bit like Bitcoin. And he says, you know, you see later when they come and they t- tell him, uh, <coughs> they, they, when they find water the first time, they, they say, mm. is that also in Gerard? Well, they say that you, we found the water, so it seems that it's a, it, was a, it was a novelty to find the water. Anyway, um, Okay, so what does Mea Sha'arim, a hundred Sha'arim, actually mean? So, I think that there are five or six different interpretations over here. And um, two, or th- two uh, I think, three interpretations of the word Sha'arim, translations, which then uh, develop into five interpretations or so of the Pasuk. So let's start with Hakal El Hakovit. First of all, you have those Rishonim who say, I'm, I'm, usually we do Rashi first, but I'm specifically leaving Rashi to later because we'll have more insight into Rashi after seeing the background of some of the other commentaries um, as well. So, first of all, we have the, the some Rishonim, uh, the Ben Ezra, and others who say that the word Sha'arim means like, um, like units. So, kind of like a measure, which is the third parish, but basically that the field produced a hundred times what he planted. So let's say he planted 
10 pounds of kernels, and he produced 1,000 pounds of kernels, right? He produced 100 times what he planted. Now, is producing 100 times what you planted really that big of a deal? So, a little bit of a Google search seems that it's not the biggest deal. I, I tried to figure out, you know, some places I saw, in the, I saw in one place you could, you, could, you could produce up to 90 times what you planted. So 100 is not that much more than 90. So some unfortunately are not so cool with this, but I think that if you take this on the backdrop of it being a year of a famine, so in a normal, in, in a good year where, the, where, where it's, the rain is plentiful and you're in a good region of, of, of fields, so then 100 might be sort of on the higher end of the spectrum of what is to be expected. But when you're talking about a year of drought and famine, so then having 100, producing 100-fold what you planted is considered a great blessing. The second interpretation is unklus, and in his interpretation, the word sha'arim means like mishai, which means to estimate. <coughs> that the field produced a hundred times what they estimated it would produce. So this field was estimated, right? A, you make an investment in a field, you have to know what's this field worth. Oh, this field can produce a hundred bushel, bushels. And now this pr- field produced, I'll read to you the words of Unclus. <coughs> he says, one, a hundred times, a hundred to one, of what it was valued at, of what it was estimated at. So, according to this interpretation, it didn't just get, produ- yield a hundred times what he planted, it yielded a hundred times what it was estimated to produce. And that, of course, is a tremendous uh, miracle. Now, the Medrash... So yes. The now, the, med- the Medrash says... There's obviously many midrashim. They all say more or less the same thing in similar wording. Starts off by saying "me sharim me means a hundred koir. Now a koir is the big, the biggest measure that we talk about in, in field. You know, nowadays you have pounds, kilos, uh, bushels, whatever. You have different <coughs> units that we measure things in. So a koir is the biggest one. So it, the measure starts off by saying he found a hundred koirim, a hundred of these measures, and then it goes on to say what Uncle says that. The field produced a hundred times what it was um, estimated to, to uh, that it w- was going to produce. So I think that we have here, even though the pirush, the, the interpretation of the pasuk is the same as Unclus, I think that in terms of the translation of the word, we have here a third translation of the word pirush. It's like a unit, a, a measurement, right? So the first one was sheer. It's like this uh, mathematical equa- formula, right? We we produced a hundred times. You yielded a hundred times what you invested. The second one was how a uh, hundred times what you was estimated, and the third one is a hundred a hundred a hundred kilos, a hundred pounds, a hundred kurt. But then the Medrash continues, and the Medrash says, why would they estimate how much the field is going to produce? There is a principle here. Sit down. There is a principle that ein habrocha shayra el al dava hasomim in hoyin that the brach Hashem's bracha is only found in something that is not that is concealed from the eye, that is not counted. That's why there's many people have a minhag. They don't count certain things. Even you have people who won't count, they won't tell you how many children they have. There's actually a funny story about that. With that. <laughs> because people say, um, people say, okay, you have so, so many children, the eye in horror, can I in horror? Yeah, what's the idea of a nine horror? Because you know, when there's a number to something, you, you don't want that to, be, to, to, to send away Hashem's bracha. But uh, Zalman Jaffe, anybody read Zalman Jaffe's books? His diaries, his humor, he was humorous. So the, 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 some people have a minute, they say, not. I'll say, I, I, I have, I have the, you count, there's, a minute, there's not 10 people here, because you're not supposed to count. That. That's another thing about not counting people. So anyway, so his daughter, Mrs. Lou, the wife, Rabbi Shmuel Lou, who many of you have met, so they have, they are in her 15 children. But he was told that you're supposed to say not. But he misunderstood the reference, and he wrote in his book that they have not 16 children, because which is true, they don't have 16 <laughs> children. <laughs> so, so, but then in the next book, he had a whole follow-up from that. But anyway, so, so wh- why in the world would the Yitzchak have the field evaluated? Evaluating the field is going to um, is going to minimize the possibility for Hashem's bracha. So the Medrash says, So why did he measure it? In order to be able to give maestres, in order to be able to give 
the tithes or the tenths of the field. So in order to know how much a tenth is, you have to know how much you have. So that's why, even though usually you don't count things, because you don't want to have to limit Hashem's <coughs> the opportunity for Hashem's bracha, but if you have to give maestras, so then a tenth has to be a tenth. You don't do uh, estimation when it comes to maestras. So that's why a so hundred measurements is uh, so good to have, right? Just easy, right? He measured a hundred. Well, so well he could always use a calculator. The point is, why did he even estimate it? He estimated it in order to know how much maestra to take. Right, but I'm Why saying do you it. Measure before you produce. You measure afterwards. Oh, very good, very good. So says Rabbi Yosef, the way the Medrash is saying is that it was that, that the way the Medrash sounds is that it, in other words, it sounds like we're saying that it was estimated before before the deal, right? My, first they estimated it, and then and then and then it turned out to be more. <coughs> uh, after it grew, the chayra first. You, first it grows, and then you need to take how much maizah. So then you estimate it. So Rabbi Yosef, the, you're asking an amazing kasha, and uh, the only other person from all the mafarshim that I looked at who asks this kasha is the rabbi. And uh, we're going to get to that in a moment. Um, just but before we get that, I need to tickle uh, my rationalist friend over here. So I saw that in Rabbi Yosef Chayshar, he says. Now you don't have to say that it actually means a hundred. The Chayshoy is one of the Rishonim Balatosus, um, and he says that it doesn't actually mean a hundred times more. It's uh, we're using the term loosely, you know. It's like I told you already a hundred times not to do that. It doesn't mean I actually said it a hundred times. It just means that the field produced a lot more than um, than would have been anticipated. Now, let's look at Rashi. I promise you, we're going to get to Rashi. Rashi says like this: Meir Sharim. Rashi quotes the words of the pasuk Meir Sharim. <coughs> They estimated how much the field was um, f- was fit to produce. And it produced a hundred times that. That's basically exactly what Uncle says. And our sages, our rabbis said, This estimation was for the sake of maestros. Now, the quote-unquote normal way to learn this Rashi, which is in fact the way that uh, many of the Mepharshim, the classical Mepharshim of Rashi, the Gurari, the Mizrahi, and others learn, as Rashi is just paraphrasing the Medrash. Rashi is saying, he's not, he's not giving two interpretations to the Pasuk, he's saying one interpretation to the Pasuk, that the, that the field produced a hundred times what it was estimated that it was going to produce. However, Rashi's adding the caveat of why would Yitzchak do that? It's not a good thing to count. The answer is, like the Medrash says, that it was done for Maestras. However, <coughs> the Cheskuni the Cheskuni says no. The Cheskuni says that when Rashi says Rabbi Seinu Omro Eimed Zala Maestras Hoya he doesn't mean to paraphrase the Medrash. He's actually adding another interpretation to the Pasuk. And the Chaskuni doesn't say this, but the Rebbe says this when the Rebbe, we'll see in a moment where we get to the, one of the Rebbe's, in other words, when you read this Rashi, Rashi says, um, it made a hundred times what it, produ- what it was set to produce, and then, so is Rabbi Seinu a new interpretation to the Pasuk, or is it just an explanation on the previous interpretation? So most Mepharshim understand that Rashi, just like the Medrash, is not giving a new interpretation, he's just explaining the previous interpretation. However, the words, the, the Cheskuni does not learn that way, and as we'll see soon, the Rebbe and the Kutisichus doesn't learn that way. And one of the, one of the points that the Rebbe brings up is that when you, if, you're coming, if, if you're coming to explain what you've just said, then the grammatically way, correct way to write it would have been V'amru Rabbi Seinu. When you say Rabbi Seinu Amru, again in English they both translate as our rabbi said. But in Hebrew it depends which way you put the wording. Is it Rabbi Seinu Amru or Amru Rabbi Seinu? Amru Rabbi Seinu means that I'm about to say something which is going to add more depth or clarity to something I've already said. But the way Rashi says it, Rabbi Seinu Amru, is usually the way you introduce a new interpretation. So there is some implication in Rashi that there is a, a, a new interpretation about to come. And the Chaskuni says, the Chaskuni doesn't make this whole Deacon Rabbi Seinu Omri, he just presents what he thinks Rashi means. And he says like this, The estimation that they made of this field was for Meiser. In other words, let's, let's, let's use numbers. They estimated the field would be a hundred 
bushels. So now, so the, in other words, they estimated that the miser would be ten. Right? Uh-huh. That's how you normally learn it. means no. What they est- when you say they estimated a hundred, that means they estimated that the mice would be a hundred. That's what Rashi means. Not that they estimated that the field would produce a hundred. They estimated that the mice would be a hundred, and that's what Yitzchak got a hundredfold of. They estimated that the mice would be a hundred, but, ter- but it turned out that the mice was a thousand. So in other words, the whole field produced a hundred thousand. So in other words, the bottom line is, according to the Cheskuni, that this interpretation means that the field produced not a hundred times what it was set to produce, but a thousand times what it was set to produce. Compound. Meaning a hundred times more than a hundred. That he, yeah, he exactly, that right? That was compound. Okay, question. yeah. Where did the mice go? Oh, very good, we're going to get to that. Well, okay. um, <laughs> so... Wouldn't it be more... Easier, just I'm sorry to interject. Wouldn't it be easier to answer up the question to say that, like in in typical um, businesses, and I would presume it'd be the same for a farming business. You know, you've got expenses, you got things that you're trying to do, and even though you're not trying to be, uh, you know, you don't want to have bad luck and count ahead, but you have, you know, what you need to cover. So you, you know, business is making a. Approximations. Okay, this is what we're looking to get. So, how much do we need to do this year in order to get this? So maybe that's so how let, you let's get it from the mice. Uh, hold that thought for a second. I want to get back to that in a moment. The way the the, the way the rebel learns the way the rebel learns practice like this, and we're not going to get into the details of the sicha here. But if you, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful Rashi sicha, which is so it has all those qualities of a stereotypical Rashi sicha with these sort of like obvious things that are staring at you in the face and you don't notice them. But basically, the way the rebel learns practice like this. Like Yosef said, after the field grew, that after it produced, finished producing, that's when they measured it in order to know how much maisa to give. And then, after Yitzchak estimated and had set aside the maisa, they suddenly found that miraculously, the field, the, the produce had multiplied itself a hundredfold. So they had to increase the maisa. So they have to increase the maizah, which we'll get to later, right? But the, 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 in other words, Rabbi Stark is learning that this is Rabbi Seino Amru, is a new interpretation, which is midrashic, it's miraculous, it's not the normal way of learning Pshut Yishol Mikra, and, that, and, and why Taka? Why did Hashem make this miracle? Because he gave maizah. In other words, like we find the Pasuk says, that if a person gives tzedakah and a person gives maizah, so then Hashem gives you a bracha. And as we find here, if Hashem right away it says Hashem blessed him. Hashem blessed him with this miraculous multiplication uh, um, that, that, that his, his 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 produce multiplied itself times a hundred because um, because in the schus of him giving maizah. So the bottom line is we have five. Let's count how many perushim we have. First of all, we have the perush that it means a hundred times what he planted. Then we have the Pirush that it means a hundred times what they estimated it, 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 would, it would give. Then we have the Pirush of um, the Bechay Shoy that it just means estimated it produced a lot more, not a hundred, but a lot more than what they produced. Then you have the Pirush of the Cheskuni that it means um, it produced a thousand times what they estimated. And then you have the Pirush of the Rebbe that after it was after after the after the measuring, that's when it multiplied itself times a hundred. Now, what Yosef is asking now is like, okay, in but you also have to be realistic and responsible in business. So, if I understand correctly, and again, I can I haven't sort of learned and uh, examined the whole sicha properly, but if I understand correctly, the Rebbe's point in that sicha is precisely that. And that's why you have these two interpretations that the normal pshutishal mitra. Interpretation is that even though in a bracha motzim al bedava hasomim in ha'ayin that the bracha you don't count things so as not to close the channels to Hashem's brachas, but business is business and you've got to count things. So that's the first interpretation. But then Rashi adds that if you want to take this idea, the, 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 the idea of tzedakah to an extreme, so that after he uh, uh, the, 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 after he after the, the, that we have the medrash that afterwards it multiplied itself a hundredfold. Okay. The bottom line is, whichever interpretation we accept, Yitzchak gave Tzedakah, Yitzchak gave Meiser, and Hashem and blessed him with tremendous bracha, tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold, whatever it is, right? What did he do with it? So, 
there's different sources which say different things, but I think the, the simplest one we could say um, is brought in one of the Midrashim. That he gave it to the poor people of that place. Now we find in Chazal that the word the Al Rebbe brings in Tanya also a few times that the, the term planting zero lochem is used for stocker. There's a puzzle zero lochem stocker. So here when we say that Yizra Yitzchak Baruch Sahi Yitzchak planted in that land, planting is synonymous for tzedakah. The Yitzchak used this miser to give tzedakah to the people of that land. Now, we're, as we'll see soon, there's this little bit of this um, overlap between Meiser giving a tenth of the produce of your field, which at least post Martin Torah in normal times is supposed to be given to the Kayan and the Levi, etc. And then you also have this giving your tenth of your earnings to Tzedakah. Now, there is overlap between those two concepts. And one of the ideas is that you have to give Meiser... It, it, when you're talking about produce, you have to give them. You have to separate the miser in order to be able to, to 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 use the rest of the produce. So even if you don't have any koyin or levi currently available, which if you want to sort of look at this from the halachic lens, Yitzchak didn't have a koyin or levi available to give anything to. But nevertheless, he had to separate the tithe because otherwise you can't eat the rest of the rest of the of the produce. If you remember, those of you who watched the video that I sent when I was in Eretz Yisrael. How you take the tithe from the from the in that case it was an orange, uh, it was an orange, right? I think it was an orange. Uh, it's a, it's a, yeah, it was an orange. Um, anyway, so but 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 again, that's sort of starting to look at it strictly halakhically. I think if you want to look at it from a more traditional perspective, the idea is he took a tithe and he gave it to Tzedakah. Okay. The Rambam and Hilchis Melachim Perik Tess when he goes through, he introduces the, um, the seven Noahide laws. And then he continues to describe the evolution, if you will, of going from the seven Noahide laws until we came to 613 mitzvahs in the Torah. And I'll read to you the Rambam. So he starts by the seven mitzvahs, okay. Then he says, This is the way it was in the whole world, that there were seven mitzvahs. Ad Avram, until Avram Avinu came. Ba Avram, and itztava yasa leila lamila, Avram came along and received the mitzvah of circumcision. Vuhu is pal shachris, and he also instituted the mitzvah of davening shachris. Vyitzchak hifrish maiser. Now it's interesting to note that the Rambam is talking here about Avram instituting shachris, which is of course based on Chazal, but we don't understand that shachris is a biblical mitzvah. Right? Shachar is not a biblical, no biblical mitzvah to daven Shachar. There's a mitzvah, even according to the Rambam, there's a biblical mitzvah to daven every day, once a day, but there's no biblical mitzvah to daven in Shachar or Mincha or Mayri. So that's important to keep in mind that whether, uh, this is going to be very important because we're going to talk soon about whether giving a tenth of your money to Tzedakah is biblical or rabbinic. Sometimes whether something is biblical or rabbinic doesn't necessarily translate into whether how important it is or isn't, right? It could be a rabbinic mitzvah that's very important, that has its roots back in the in the Yisoydus of our nation and our forefathers, they instituted to do this thing, and that's at the bedrock of us as a nation is, for example, dominating Shachas Min Chaimayrev every day, even though it's only a rabbinic mitzvah to daven shachas min every day, and the Rambam, who's a, who's a hal- strict halachist, is inserting this in his book of halachas because it's important for us to know that. But Yitzchak Yifrish Meiser, Yitzchak separated Meiser. Now, wh- how do we know that Yitzchak separated Meiser? Like we just saw, it doesn't say it explicitly in the Torah, but based on the medrash on this pasuk that the hundred shaarim were there because of Meiser, so that's how we know that Yitzchak Yifrish Meiser. Yitzchak also added an additional prayer at the end of the day, which we call Mencha. Yaakov, Yosef did Hanosha. Yaakov added. We're going to read in this week's parsha. Um, yeah, No, Gid Hanosha is my Yishlach or my Yitzchak. Gid Hanosha. Yeah, next week's yeah, parasha. The so next week's parasha, we're going to read about the Gid Hanosha, that was Yaakov. He spal alarvis, he davened Meiriv. Over Mitzrayim, Nitztavo Amram be Mitzvah Yisrael. In Mitzrayim, Amram was commanded with more mitzvahs. 
Asher by Moshe Rabbeinu, when Nishlam Atayr Adad, until Moshe Rabbeinu came, who and the Torah was completed through him, where we got in in Mara Shabbos Kibudov Aim Parah Dumar etc. And then until we got the Matan Torah and we got the full six hundred and thirteen mitzvahs. He, he I'll ma- just digress for a moment. Yeah, the, the Meiser is mentioned in that. In that yeah, the Yitzchak is Meiser. But, but that, that he decided to do that on his own, right? That wasn't uh, like he doesn't say no. No, the only one that he says that he was commanded on is Avram. That Avram was Nitzstava Al Hamila. That Avram was commanded regarding circumcision. All the other ones, he says, they added it. This is the Rambam and Hilchus Malachim. This, is, this is the fourth to last chapter of the entire Mishnah Torah. But Paraduma was commanded. Right? Later. Right. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't say. Some it says, Venishma Matera al Yodai. Okay, I just want to just want to point out, uh, just to completely, by the way, just I found this very interesting. I saw this recently, so I'll share it. Rambam says that Amram was, nitsta, was given mitzvahs in Mitzrayim. Now, the Chesed Vishter, all the Mepharshim say, like, where, where does Rambam get this from? Where, where do we ever find anywhere, not in, explicitly in the Torah, not in the Chazal, that there were any mitzvahs given to the Jewish people through Amram? And um, which mitzvahs were they? Anyway, there's various interpretations in the Mepharshim of what this means. But something Mechudush, which we saw, we saw this together in the Meshach Achma, Meshach Achma says that the Rambam has this approach, and it's unclear to me where the Meshach Achma gets this from. But this is what he says, that any person in the Torah who we find that Hashem is miyachet shmuel of, that it says, Elokei so-and-so, oh, yeah. that means that that person is part of this chain of giving mitzvahs. Right? So, Elokei Avram, because Avram has the mitzvah of Mila and Shachras. Elokei Yitzchak, Elokei Yaakov. And we find in Parshish Shmois, that when Hashem first reveals himself at the fiery bush to Moshe Rabbeinu, he says, I am the God of your father. So who's your father? He says, first he says, I'm the God of your father. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So who's your father? Amram. So from the fact that the Torah says about Amram, that's where the Rambam deduces it from, that Amram got mitzvahs. Okay, just an interesting tidbit. All right, anyway, let's get back on track over here. Yitzchak, the Rambam says, that Yitzchak introduced Meiser. Now, before we continue, how do you understand what this means, that Yitzchak introduced Meiser? What, did, what exactly did Yitzchak introduce? What type of Meiser? Meiser Ani. Meiser Ani, to the poor person. What do you think? From a field. Uh, Meiser from a field. Meiser of produce. Yeah. So really, you're both saying that, because Meiser Ani is also that you give a tithe from the produce to the poor people. Because Avram already did it, but he d- it was kind of... Oh, hold on, hold on, we'll get to Avram in a second. <laughs> so this is a story of Ruth and Boaz, too. It's also that we're talking about in, in line with uh, Yitzchak it being more Gvuradik, right? It's that he's yeah. at the measure is probably what he's trying right. to say. Okay. You know, as opposed to Tzedakah being, you know, boundless, right? It's a, it's a All right. So let's see what the Rivet says. The Rivet right. says, Okay, um... When he, when the Rambam says that Avram has circumcision and chakra, says the Rambam, no, the Rambam is wrong. What he ought to have said is that he daven chakra is Maisa. and Avram gave Maisa. Why is the Ram, Why is the Rambam attributing Maisa to Yitzchak if we're trying to give sort of the chain of events? The first time we encounter the mitzvah of Maisa is with Avram Avinu. Why is the Rambam attributing it to Yitzchak? What's the story with Avram Avinu? So this brings us back to Parshas Lech Lecha in Bereshis chapter 14 where, and I'm going to read for you a, a, a number of Pesukim because the context is going to be important. Vayetzei Melech Sodom Lekrosei So the king of Sodom comes out to greet Avram after he returns from uh, the, the, the battle with the four kings. O Malki Tzedek Malach Sholim. Malki Tzedek, who is the king of Sholim. What's another name for Malki Tzedek? Anybody remember? The king of righteousness? No, no Malki Tzedek. What, who, what, 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 what other name is Malki Tzedek known oh. by? Uh, shame. No? Shame. shame. Malki Tzedek is the son of Noach, who's known as Shame. Noach had three sons, Shame, Chom, and Yafet. So this is Shame. And he is Melech Sholim, and Sholim is otherwise known as Yerushalayim. Right? He was the king of the city, which later became Yerushalayim. He brought out bread and wine. He is a, he, meaning Malki Tzedek, is a kohen to Hashem. He serves Hashem. He's a representative of Hashem. By the way, we find also in last week's parsha that 
when when Rivka is concerned about her pregnancy, she goes to seek Hashem, to seek out Hashem. Who does she go to? Rashi says she goes to the base of Hashem Veiva, right? So we find that Shem, Shem is the representative of Hashem in this generation. He blessed him. Who blessed who? Shem blessed Avraham. And he said, who said? Shem. The Baruch Avram the Kelelim blessed is Avram to the exalted God, Koine Shemaim Varetz, who um, acquires heaven and earth. Uvarich Kelelim and blessed is the exalted God, Asher Migain Sorecha Biyadecha. Rashi says that means who has delivered your enemies into your hands. Vayitain Loy and he gave to him. Who gave to who? Avram gave to Shem. Avram gave to Shem. What do you say? Malkitzedek gave to Avram. Well, if you're saying consistent with the pronouns, right? Right. Okay, and he gave him a tenth from everything. So somebody gave somebody a tenth of everything. Okay, so then the Melech Sudoim says to Avram, um, Give me the people back, and you keep all the spoils. You keep all the money, just give me my people. This is Melech Sudoim, this is not Malkitzedek anymore. Avram says to Malach Sudaim, I'm going to make an oath, I'm not taking anything. In Mechut, famous oath, in Mechut, I'm not going to take anything. You shouldn't be able to say that you are the one who made Avram of you know, wealthy. I want everybody to know that I got my wealth directly from Hashem, not from you. Okay. So, who gave who my sir? Now, if you're going to stick with the pronouns, right? Um, with all the he's over here are talking about shame, Malki Tzedek. Malki Tzedek said, Malki Tzedek gave, Malki Tzedek gave, right? Yeah, the Torah never sticks with the promise. Oh, the Torah never sticks with the promise. <laughs> now, another, another point to ponder. If you say that it means Avraham gave a tenth to Malki Tzedek, so what happened to the other 90%? Uh, well, uh, my... Well, well let's slow down. Just one second. It says he gave it. Let's 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 hypothesize. Let's consider both interpretations. If it means that there's all this stuff over here, and Avram took a tenth of it and gave it to Malki Tzedek, wh- wh- where's the other ninety percent? He still has it. He still, still has it. But two him later, he tells the king of Sodom that I'm not keeping anything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that means he gave ninety percent to the king of Sodom and ten percent to uh, to the Cohen. Uh, Huh? Yeah, besides he won't take anything besides the part the besides the part that he gives to Ani Ashkel to the to the people who helped him. Like he's not he's not uh, going to withhold from them their part. Okay. So, so for those two reasons, it would seem to suggest that Malki Tzedek gave to Avraham a tenth, right? Because again, because of the pronouns. And also, if, if he, Avram took, kept nothing, Malki Tzedek gave him a tenth. Now, we don't know if Avram then kept that tenth or gave that back to Malach Shadim also, whatever it is. But to say that Avram gave a tenth to Malki Tzedek... How does that make any sense? Malki Tzedek wasn't... What was he doing? Why would well, he be giving... He, what does he have? Malki Tzedek doesn't have anything to give. Avram's got the stuff. Oh, oh, okay, very good, very good. So you're uh, you're saying, if if we're going to say it means Malki Tzedek, he gave him a tenth of what? What did he give him a tenth of? Okay. But now, m- one second. Ma- Malki Tzedek, and if you go back at the at the Pesukim over there in, 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 in Perik Yudalad. One second. Malki Tzedek is not one of the four or five kings, right? <coughs> so how, uh, so I'm not, it's not clear, I'm not sure exactly what his position was and how he, but, but he's talking about the same stuff that, um, right, let me see. Yeah. Malki Tzedek, and, uh, he, was, he was part of the Malach Sodoim's team, right? So, okay. I want to, before we get to the different interpretations, let's just go back to the Ravid. So the Ravid, the Ravid is clearly learning Pshat over here, that Avram gave a tenth to Malkit Tzedek. 
if Avram gave a tenth to Malkit Tzedek, and as Rashi says, we'll see in a minute more from Rashi, but Rashi says, why is he giving it to Malkit Tzedek? Because it says, Vuhu Koyin. Now Malkit Tzedek was a Koyin, therefore he gave him a tenth, because you give Maisa to the Koyin. Now, even though you give Maisa to the Levi, but you could also give, the Gemara says, you could also give Maisa to the Koyin. Um, which is what Ezra, in fact, did after the second, uh, after the, when they came back up. But anyway, the idea is that because Malkit Tzedek is a Koyin, therefore Avram gave him a tenth. Says the Ravid, says the Ravid, oh, so why is Avram saying that Yitzchak instituted Maisa? Avram already gave Maisa. That's the Ravid's Kasha on the Rambam. Says the Kasha Mishnah, no, you got it all wrong. Avram wasn't giving a tenth of his money. Avram was giving, of it in general. Avram was just giving a tenth of the spoils of the war. And that was, um, it wasn't uh, as part of Tzedakah or Maisa, it was just to honor Malki Tzedek. He was giving him, Malki Tzedek brought out Lechem uh, Vayoyin, he brought out and made a feast, and he gave Avram a bracha, so reciprocation. Avram says, you know, I'm going to give you a nice tip. But we don't find that Avram actually gives Maisa. Whereas Yitzchak, he actually gave a tenth of his money to Tzedakah, and that's why the Rambam invokes Yitzchak. Now, Okay, so if you read this Kassim Mishnah, essentially the Kassim Mishnah is making two very important points. First of all, he's saying that according to the Rambam, Avram didn't even get, this has nothing to do with Miser, just happens to be a tenth. Okay. And number two, he's learning that Yitzchak's Miser is not like you guys said that Yitzchak's Miser was a tenth of t- a tithe of the produce. It was like giving a tenth, like you give Miser from your money. Right? Now, I don't know where the Kassim Mishnah gets that from. It doesn't, neither the Rambam nor the Ravid say that they're talking here about miser of money. They could both be talking about miser. Now, <laughs> but, but if you say, if you say that we're talking about miser of, of, of tvua, of produce, well then how does Avram come into the picture? We're not talking about produce, we're talking about spoils from the war. Mm-hmm. So, there seems to be this sort of obscurity, or com, com, what's the word, um, conflating the two types of miser, miser from produce, and Raisa from money. We'll get back to that in a moment. But wh- where we're at right now is we have Machloikas, the Rambam, and the Ravid. The Rambam says Yitzchak introduced Maisa, the Ravid says Avram introduces Maisa. Now, we already said that there's certainly a pos- uh, um, plausible and perhaps even probable interpretation of the Psukim that actually Avram didn't give Maisa at all. It was Malki Tzedek who gave Maisa to Avram. And it could be that the Rambam read the Psukim that way, and that's why he says that Yitzchak introduced Maisa, because according to him, Avram never gave Maisa. Malki Tzedek gave it to Avram. Now, then you could ask, okay, so why doesn't he say that Shem Ben Noach introduced Maisa? But okay. This interpretation is found in Rishonim. Um, and the Radak quotes this actually Bashem his father, he quotes his own father he says, my father says it must be that Malkit Tzedek gave it to Avram because you see that Avram refused to keep anything so how could it be that he um, that, he, that, that he kept 90% so it must mean the other way around that Malkit Tzedek gave it to Avram now um, so it could be that the Rambam Taka interpreted it this way. By the way, I saw an interesting vote from Chaim Kanievsky in Time of the Crow. He says like this, that really he builds it up and uh, has a whole thing. But he, his point is that um, Avram Avinu originally didn't have any problem keeping this money because he was Eichem in a Hefker. In other words, what's Avram Avinu's thing? He doesn't want to take money from anybody because he doesn't want people to say, I made you rich. He wants it to be obvious that it comes from Hashem. Now, the king of Sodom and his comrades, they abandoned all this stuff. They would long given up. So it's all Hefker. And he took it all and he was planning to keep it. And that's why he gave the tenth to Malki Tzedek, because he was planning to keep it. And he's giving a tenth to the Kayin. But then the king of Sodom wakes up and he says, you know, ten li anafish for a chush kachloch. Give me the people, you could keep the money. Now, why is the king of Sodom telling him you could keep the money? Like, Nothing is yours. You lost everything, and I got it. Now, everything is mine. The people is mine. The money is mine. Everything is mine. So you should just say, Tanli Anefesh, please give me the people. Why are you telling me, please give me the people, and oh, I'll be so, I'll be so kind and let you, Avram, keep the money. So as soon as Avram hears the king of Sodom talking this language, he's like, I want nothing to do with this. I don't want, of course, rightfully, this money is mine, and it was Hefker, and it had nothing to do with the king of Sodom. But I don't want, I don't want you, I don't want you to be able to go around saying, oh, I'm the source of Avram's richness. 
keep the whole law. So in other words, according to that interpretation, it's Taka Avram who gave the money to Malki Tzedek. Are you saying, what about the 90%? Yeah, at that point, Avram was still planning to keep the 90%. It was only later when the Melech Sodom rears his ugly head that Avram, Avram says, you know what, I want nothing to do with this. Yeah. You know, uh, Yaakov got all these flocks and they multiplied, and he's leaving. And all them, you know, it's mine. Yeah, yeah. Everything's mine. Bonnie, Bonnie, everything's mine. Like just like the the the, the dome. Exactly. Exactly. Bonnie, so this is a very simple. This last, this last thing, this shot you're saying. That I saw in time with the crow from Mukham Kanievsky. Um, so. Where we're at right now is we could have a very easy way to interpret the Rambam and the Ravid. The Rambam holds that Yitzhak Meisim Mikol means Malki Tzedek gave it to Avram. The Ravid holds that it means Avram gave it to Malki Tzedek, and that's why he holds Avram introduced Meisim, and he holds that Yitzchak introduced Meisim. Now, I'll tell you two other perushim in the pasuk that could also help explain the Rambam. This puzzle, the, this, um, so first of all, this is based, the, the, the Chassam Seifer quotes this from the Zohar, and I see the Meshachachma also says this, but the Meshachachma doesn't quote the Zohar. So, I guess the, the Meshachachma probably didn't say it, he probably came up with it himself. But he says that, Vayitan Leimaisam Akrael doesn't mean Avram, and it doesn't mean Malchit Tzedek either. It says like this, you have to read the pasuk like this. Malki Tzedek says, Baruch Kelelim, blessed is the exalted God, Asher Migin Tzorecha B'Yodecha, who delivered your enemies into your hand, Vayitin Loi, and he, that exalted God, gave him, gave to Avram, Maisim Mikhail. Hashem gave Avram Maisim Mikhail. What does it mean Hashem gave Avram Maisim Mikhail? Because Hashem gave Avram the land of the seven out of the seventy nations. That is a reward for Avram Zavaytis Hashem. He gets the land of Israel, which is the land of seven nations, which is a tenth of the nations of the world. And the Chesim Sefer points out that there's a piyot, which we don't say this piyot, but maybe Ari does, I don't know who says it. There's a piyot in Shabbos HaGadol, which says that Hashem gives the seven nations to Avram, kebas hanitelis isu nechasim, like a daughter who takes a tenth of the, right, the din is that when, when, uh, if a father dies, that the sons inherit it, but they have to give each of the daughters a tenth of the estate when they get married. And um, then he adds that the Zoyar says, um, the Zoyar says that, uh, no, maybe the Chassam Sefer himself is saying this, that Hashem is telling you, I'm not going to give it to you like a daughter who takes a tenth, I'm going to give it to you like a Koyan who takes a tenth. And in fact, um, the Gemara Taka says that, the Gemposuk says here that Malki Tzedek was a Koyan, but the Gemara says that Malki Tzedek was only a Koyan up until this point. At this point, Malki Tzedek made a big mistake. He said, blessed is Avram, before he said, blessed is God, and therefore Hashem confiscated the kahuna from him and gave it to Avram. And that's why Avram at this point became the Koyin, and that's why he got the tenth. Which may also be why, according to those interpretations, why Malki Tzedek gave um, Avram the tenth, because now he's the Koyin. Um, anyway. Why would he give it anyway? He doesn't have any. Who? Giving what? Malki Tzedek what is Malki Tzedek wasn't Tzedek involved have? in the battle, and he doesn't have the spoils. So it could so it could be that he does have some uh, some access to the spoils. It could also mean uh, I'm gonna we're gonna see in a minute Rashi. It could also mean that he just gave him a tenth of whatever nothing to do with the spoils. He just he gave him he gave him a tenth. Okay, we'll see in a minute. That's what Rashi says. We'll, but, we'll, we'll get that in a minute. One second, one second. I just want to say that according to this, um, we could say. So, so again, b- b- uh, let's just recap where we are. We have here Machlokas Rambam and Ravid, who introduced Meiser. We have so far we've uh, we, we've we've I, I've suggested two ways to understand the Machlokas. One way to understand the Machlokas is who's giving to who. How do you translate the pasuk? Alternatively, we had the case of Mishnah who said, no, Avram wasn't really giving Meiser, he was just, whatever, he was giving him something. Yitzchak is the one who introdu- introduced Meiser, and I remember pointed out, like, where does the Ketz of Mishnah get it from, that Avra- Yitzchak is giving Meiser Ksofim, the Chayre is giving Meiser of the produce. Now, you could say, is it, to turn the Ketz of Mishnah's plate on its head, and say exactly the opposite way around, that Avram Taka gave 
a tenth as tzedakah to Malki Tzedek, or you know, he gave him a tenth in that, in the, because of a tenth of his, his, his earnings, and that's why the Rambam doesn't bring it, because the Rambam is not talking about that. He's specifically talking about giving a tenth of the produce, which is what Yitzchak does. Mm-hmm. Um, especially now, it could be that the, another quite interesting question to ask is the pastors the Rambam holds that my Sofim is the Rabbanon, that the whole mitzvah of giving my Sofim is only the Rabbanon but that would not in and of itself be a re- reason for the Rambam not to mention it as we saw the Rambam does bring Shachos Minachal Mairev which are also the Rabbanon so that's another sort of loose string which I don't really have a way to tie it up but, uh, but the Mepharshim do I- introduce that um, that the Mepharshim do introduce that Svara into the equation, and there's a very interesting raya to this Svara from Unklus, right? In other words, what we suggest, the Svara, the svara, the third, the svara that we're suggesting right now is that the reason why the Rambam doesn't mention Avram is because Avram gave a tenth of his of the spoil or of his own earnings, whatever it was, but it was it was betoyrus, like we think of giving a tenth from the money that we earn, not betoyrus giving a tenth of the produce. Now, what's a good raya to that? The word Meiser is found in the Torah many, many times. Any time the mitzvah of Meiser comes up. The Unkelos always translates that word with the Aramaic ma- Ma'asra. Like, for example, Aser to Aser. The Unkelos says Asra to Aser. Right? The Aramaic is basically the same word. It's Samach instead of a sin, which is basically a negligible difference. Right? There are two times when Unkelos translates the word Meiser not with that sort of noun, Meiser, but a tenth, chad min asra, a tenth. Usually he just translates meiser as meiser. The word meiser has its own noun. You know, when you give a tenth of your, the, the tithe, right, in English we say a tithe, a tithe of your produce, that's called meiser. There are two times in the Torah where the Torah says the word meiser and Unclus changes and translates it as chad min asra, one out of ten, a tenth. One of those two times is here by Avram. So we see, the we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so we'll see that we see that Avram's tenth is nothing to do. We're talking here about Meiser. We're not talking about we're talking about Meiser from from produce. When 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 the Rambam says that Yitzchak Hifrish Meiser, he means Yitzchak gave a tenth of his produce. That was the initial mitzvah of giving Meiser from your field. Avram gave tenth. Fine, that's not, that's a nice thing in the Taka the Minak to give the Minak or the mitzvah, or whatever you want to call it, to give a tenth of your earnings to tzedakah, maybe that's like based on of Ramavino. But that's not what the Rambam's talking about. So that would be another way, similar to the case of Mishnah. It's sort of the opposite of the case of Mishnah, but the same idea. So again, let's recap. We've had so far three possible ways to understand this Machlokus, the Rambam and the Raifet. One way is that they translate the words Vayitan Leimasim Mikoyel differently. The, Ram, the Ravid holds that Avram gave to Malki Tzedek. The Rambam holds that either Malki Tzedek gave to Avram or Hashem gave to Avram. Then we have the case of Mishnah who says that Yitzchak is talking about Maisek Safim and Avra, about giving a tenth from earnings and Avram is just talking about giving a nice tip to Malki Tzedek. And then we have this third interpretation which I don't know if I saw any Mepharshim explicitly saying this, or if I'm suggesting it myself, I don't remember anymore, that Avram is giving a tenth of his earnings to Tzedakah, to, to Malki Tzedek, versus, and that's not what the Rambam is talking about, the Rambam is talking about giving a tenth from produce. Now, um, <coughs> we do find, we said that the Ravid holds that it means Malki Tzedek, Avram gave to Malki Tzedek, and we asked the question, um, we asked the question that it doesn't seem what were the questions we asked? The, the Ravid holds that Avram gave to Malki Tzedek. So, oh, so one of the questions was that um, the main question that Radak brought from his father, right? That if Avram doesn't want to keep anything, so how, why is he giving a tenth? It's not much he's giving another ninety percent. So we saw Chaim Kinevsky has an interesting chiddush over there, but uh, going to the Rishonim. The Ramban and Rashi don't explicitly ask the question, but they seem to be um, anticipating the question. The Ramban says, Avram indeed didn't want to keep anything. However, before he gives it all back to king of Tudayim, he is duty-bound to take that which belongs to God and give it to the Koyin, which is God's, like we said before, shame, the Koyin is God's representative. Rashi so, says that? Ramban. Oh, the Ramban says that. So the Ramban, your, your friend, you're going to learn. You, oh. 
Ramban Lech Lavo, you do. Yeah. You learned this Ramban. Mm-hmm. No? Well, I, I was going to so, get that answer. I didn't know where I got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? So that's what, like Mark said before, yeah, yeah, even if you don't have anyone to give it to, you have to be mafresh it. You have, you have to say, here, I'm going to give you everything back to the king of Sudan, the 90% I'm giving you back. But before I do so, it's come to my possession, I have to take my from it. Rashi says something else. Rashi says, He gave him maizam mikoil, from everything. What, what's this word from everything? says, Rashi, mikol shaloi. We're not talking here about the spoils. And L'Chayr, Rashi seems to be anticipating this question. Avram didn't touch the spoils. He gave it all back to the king of Sudan. But now Avram has encountered shame. And shame is the Koyin L'Kayl el So he's giving the Koyin Maisa. He's giving him a tenth of his earnings. So I just I, perhaps we could borrow Rashi Svara Yosef. You were saying, Malki said that gives Avram, what does he have to give him? Maybe the same thing. Mikola Shaloi, he gave him a tenth of all his things. He, he finally meets Avram Avinu. I mean, it's not the first time they've met. Avram certainly had met Shem Ben before. But this was, they were meeting at this, perhaps for the first time in a while. And especially if you take on the, the Gemara that says that at this point Hashem confiscated the Kahuna from Shem and gave it to Avram. So now suddenly the tables are turned and Malki said, says, okay, now you're the Kohen. Okay, here's my bank account. I'm giving you a tenth. I did actually find it important to note before we move on to the next um, to Yaakov Avinu um, is that there's a medrash in Psikta Rabba that says that Yitzchok gave when it says um, one second that, that, sorry that says when Avram Avinu gave Maes and Mikhail, it means Maes Rishon Maes Rishon means the first tithe that you give from the produce so even though we're talking here about spoils and this and that the med- this particular medrash understands that we're actually talking about literal tithes, and um, perhaps is, perhaps the Ravid, who's asking the question on the Rambam, why doesn't the Rambam bring bring uh, from Avram Avinu? Perhaps the Ravid is basing himself in this medrash that says that, that that says that in other words, we were understanding that Avram. We're not talking about tithes of produce, right? In the case of Mishnah, we said yeah, is, he's talking about Yitzchak took tithes from produce, but Avram didn't, right? According to this message, Avram also gave tithe from, gave tithe from produce, and perhaps the rivets kasha on the Rambam. Yeah, why you Rambam saying Yitzchak introduced Maisa? You should have said Avram introduced Maisa. Perhaps the rivet is based on this psikta, which is a halachic medrash that says that Avram also gave gave tithe from the produce. Halachic medrash as opposed to agadic medrash. <coughs> All right, meaning it wasn't the the bound, it wasn't the spoils of war. Yeah, yeah. According to this, and upon him, where we're at until now, we have. Whether you hold like the Rambam or the Ravid, we have both Avram and Yitzchak giving tithes. Whether they're giving tithes from the produce, or they're giving tithes from the earnings, or from the spoils. Different perushim. And then we come to this week's parsha. <coughs> and this week's parsha, in today's chitas, we learn in parsha Svayetze that Avram makes a vow. Yaakov. Yaakov, sorry, makes it out, thank you. That this stone will be the house of God. And everything that you give me, that you, God, gives me, Yaakov, I will take a tenth for you. Now, before I move on, I just want to, I want to share something which occurred to me yesterday. The Gemara learns out from this pasuk the principle, which many of you have heard of, we've, dis- we've discussed it a number of times in the Sunday classes, that a person shouldn't give, there are, it's brought in Tanya a few times, a person, generally speaking, is not, shouldn't give more than a fifth, more than 20% to tzedakah. The Gemara d- derives that from this pasuk. Everything you will give me, Aser Asrenu I will t- take a tenth to you, but we have the double expression, Aser Asrenu, so two times a tenth is a fifth, 20%, right? We don't need uh, even with the with the cheder math education. We know that two times a tenth is a fifth, and um, and that and the Gemara actually asked, but well, if you take two times the tenth, then the second tenth is going to be less than the first tenth, right? Because yeah, if you take if you have a hundred and you take off ten, then you have ninety. The second tenth is only going to be nine. The Gemara says no, both tenths are the same. Okay, so from here we learn out not to give more than a fifth to tzedakah under normal circumstances. Now. Usually, when you have it in Hebrew, in the, in the Torah, it's common that you have a double expression. Aser to aser, vigam dali dala lano. Yeah, there's no, numerous times that you have the verb in this double expression. Now, always the trap, the tune of the words, is going to put those two words together. Right? Vigam dali dala lano. Right? When Moshe Rabbeinu drew, draws the water for the daughters of Yisrael, 
has that double expression. We got Doloi, 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 Doloi goes together, right? Um, aser to Aser is called what? Right? Aser to Aser goes together. Roi Roi Isias Oni Ami Asher B'Mitzrayim. Roi 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 Isias Oni Ami, right? Always the two words go together. Here, there's an exception, and it's very noticeable because it's the end of the Aliyah. So, I mean, this, uh, I noticed it's this yesterday by me. Here, it's a tip Mercha. In other words, if I was putting the trap over here, the end of the Pasuk, I would have done it. That's, that's if I was writing the trap, that's how I would think it should go. But in fact, the trap does it the opposite. It goes, Aser, Asre, no. If you're listening to Laning, and it's very obvious because it's the end of the Aliyah, yeah? Doesn't, you're putting a comma in the middle of a verb. Right? So I'm suggesting, I didn't see this in the Mepharshim, but perhaps this is where the Gemara gets it from. How does the Gemara get it to, to derive from here? That it means two times a tenth, and it means that you shouldn't give more as than a, a fifth. As opposed to like surely give or something. Yeah. It, 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 because because we have the truck making the comma in the middle of the word tells me uh, you split it. It's a tenth, and then another tenth, and tenth plus a tenth is a fifth. Okay. Zok to Bedrish on this pasuk from Yaakov Aminu says v'cholash atitin liaser asenolach says the Medrash Yaakov tikein losis meiser min hamamayin. Until now, we know Avram gave a tenth either from the spoils or from the produce. Yitzchak gave a tenth from the produce. Comes again, Yaakov Avinu, in this week's parasha, and he says, you have to give a tenth of your money to Hashem. You have to give a tenth of your money to Tzedakah. How do you know he's talking about money? So I saw, um, I think in the Bavarom and Rambam brings, that um, if you look at the previous part, to Psukim, he says, what are you going to... If you'll be, if Hashem will be with me and protect me in this journey that I'm taking, Hashem will give me food to eat and clothing to wear. So we're not talking about produce. We're talking about food and drink, uh, food and clothing. And even from that, I'm going to give myself. Um, now, it's interesting to note that Rashi in this pasuk over here doesn't say anything. He doesn't say what Asir Asan Allah means. But in next week's parasha, in parasha Zayishlach, Rashi does quote this pasuk, and he says that when Yitzchak, when Yaakov Avinu is taking all the malachi, all the animals to send as a gift to Esav, min he took from what comes to his hand. So what does it mean from what comes to his hand? So Rashi says over there that he took meiser. It was mafresh the meiser, and the rest is only chulin. So in other words, according to Rashi, asir asran Allah means that I'm going to take meiser from the animals. Until now, we were talking about my, there's two. There's the, in other words, in the Torah, there's three mitzvahs of ma'aser. There's ma'aser from produce, which includes ma'aser rishu, ma'aser sheni, ma'aser ani, which is actually three three mitzvahs. Then you have ma'aser from animals to give a tenth of every animal to, 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 to as a carbon, right? And then we have ma'aser ksofim to give a tenth of our earnings. So Rashi seems to understand that what Yaakov introduces to the pic- picture is not a tenth of his earnings like we previously un- brought from the Madrash, but it means a tenth of the animals. Because later when he's sending the animals to Esav, Rashi says, that, that he took away already a tenth of those animals. Um, now, Rashi actually does match with other Mephoshim over here who talk about the tenth being the tenth of animals to bring us Karbonus. And in fact, we find later on, the Pasuk says that Yaakov says to his family after they leave Shechem, he says that we should go back. We'll go and build him his back to the God that answered my prayers on the day that I called out to him. So that seems to be a reference to this prayer that Yaakov makes right over here. And in response to this prayer, what is Yaakov Avinu saying? I'm going to build him his back. So it seems that the prayer of, uh, I'm going to make a house for God, which is, includes karbonus, like the Rambam says in the beginning of Beis HaBechira, that the definition of a house for God is bias, lius, makriv, and karbonus. Aser, aser, according to those Mepharshim, also means karbonus. So the bottom line is that we have um, two interpretations to what Yaakov introduces to the picture. Either he's introducing Meister Behema, or he's introducing um, Meister of all of your earnings. And then, there's a, another very interesting medrash, which he says, I'm going to give a myself mamish everything, even my sons. <coughs> Yaakov Avinu has 14 sons. If you count uh, Menashe and Ephraim, there's 14 sons. Says the medrash, four, the, four out of the 14 are Bechairis. Ruvain, Yosef, God, and Don, I think, are Bechairim. They're Bechairim. So they're out of the picture. So we're left with 10. 
left with ten. Out of every ten, just like out of every ten animals, you have to give one to Hashem. Yaakov gave one son, he gave Levi to Hashem. That was his fulfillment of Maiser. Now, and then finally, one more interpretation, a fourth interpretation to Yaakov, which I saw only in Achronim, but it's an interesting one, that Mikol, he says, Kol Hashatitli, everything that you give me, I'll give as a miracle, meaning even things which are parted from Maiser, even things which I get as a, which I... Which, which I get purchased. In certain cases, if you purchase things, you don't need to give Maisa from the animals, or is something which comes, which Hashem gives me in a mir- miraculous way. The Radak brings, we read in the Haftarah last week, that the, uh, the Shunamis, uh, not the Shunamis, the, the, the wife of Avadia, um, Alicia tells her to go and pour the oil on all the cups. So, after she's finished pouring all the oils, she goes to Alicia and says, what do I do now? And tells her to go and pay the debts, and the, why is he going to ask him what to do? You, you have all this thing, go pay your debt. Why are you coming to ask Elisha? So the Radak brings that, I think, Bisham in the Medrash, that she was going to ask him if she needs to give Maisa from it. And, uh, and, uh, and the, the, the Elisha told her, you don't need to give Maisa because it's not, it's not real produce. It's, uh, it's, it's, mirac- it's miraculous. You give Maisa on Sadaka, my love? Huh? You give Maisa on Sadaka? Someone's receiving Sadaka, do they give Maisa on it? That's a complicated question. Um, so, so Akapanim, it could be even the things that he's going to give as, uh, as, a, as, a, as that, that he received as a miracle, he would have to give Maisa from them. So, I just want to close off with the following thought. Whether we're talking about Maisa, a tithe from produce, or whether we're talking about a tithe from the animals, or whether we're talking about a tithe from what Hashem gives us, and as the Rabbi Ram, Ramban and Rambam says here, that even a very poor person has to give tzedakah, even if all you're going to give me is lechem lechem, the beg of I'm just going to have the bare needs for food, bread to eat, and, and the clothing to wear, I'm still going to give a tenth. There's a common theme to all of these things. And the common theme is to recognize that what we have is not, from what, is not our own, from what, what we have is a gift from God, and therefore we owe a, a part of it to Hashem, which is that is really the aside of giving Maisa, what we call today Maisa, a tenth of our earnings, to Tzedakah. Like the Rebbe always quotes from the Fidik Rebbe, Hashem, you think Hashem gave you $100? Hashem didn't give you $100. Hashem gave you $90. And He also gave you $10 to be His um, bank, uh, banker to, get, to, 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 to give it to Tzedakah. That money was never yours. And that is really the underlying theme to all of these mitzvahs. And what we see over here is that all of these mitzvahs, including giving Tzedakah, is not, uh, we, we talk, is it the Raisa, is it the Rabbanan, is it the Minhag? Be it as it may, whether it's the Raisa, whether it's the Rabbanan, whether it's the Minhag, it's something which lies at the very foundation of Klal Yisrael as a nation. By Avram, by Yitzchak, and by Yaakov, we always find this emphasis on recognizing that we're giving a tenth to Hashem, because, and like Avram says, even if you're a poor person, everybody has to give a tenth to Hashem to recognize this. And we'll finish off with reading a medrash. Shakein Motzinu Ba Avram. Avram gives Maisa. Yaakov, Ksiv Aser, Asenolach, Yitzchok, Vayirachehu Hashem. That when in fact we recognize this and we give Tzedakah properly, Hashem blesses us, take it for the Maisa's Bracha. As soon as we give Tzedakah, Hashem gives us a blessing, which is what we saw in the Sicha from Yitzchak Avinu giving Maisa, that right away he had this miraculous blessing. And as the Pasuk says, Hashem says, test me out in this. That if you give tzedakah, will I not open for you the windows of the heaven? And I'll empty out for you, to you, I'll pour to you cups of blessing, ad beli dai, as the Gemara explains that to mean, that you'll never be able to have enough of Hashem's blessing. L'chaim, l'chaim.